Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Meyer and I'm the membership manager for the San Diego Mycological Society. I'm in charge of making sure that everybody knows about all of the great benefits that um, we have as a member. You can go on forays and cooking classes and other workshops and such. And we are just about at 300 members, so we would love you to sign up and join and push us over the edge and expand our mycelial network. I'm also a graduate student at The Ohio State University, attending remotely from San Diego at the moment, studying mycology. Enjoy the fungus fair. Now I'd like to share some information about fun mushrooms you can find here in Southern California. But before I do that, I'd like to let you know a little bit more about the San Diego Mycological Society, along with who we are and what we do. So as you can see here, we do a variety of things such as meetings, uh, hold have speakers, conduct classes and forays and dinners and film screenings and identifications. So once a month, the first Monday of every month, we host lectures and speakers where from all walks of disciplines within mycology, from hardcore academic mycologists conducting research into ecology, let's say, to anthropologists or podcasters or artists. So from all walks of various different mycological life. And we also host regular cultivation classes, teaching you how to grow your own mushrooms, um, both in a variety of methods. As you can see here at the top left, we have spawn bags um, with straw, and we can also do log spawn, which will take a little bit longer to grow, but it will last much longer and have to give a higher yield. We also end up doing cooking demonstrations, such as what we, the video we released for our stuffed mushroom day earlier uh, a week ago. And one of our most popular activities are our forays. We will take groups of people, uh, typically inland to let's say Poway or to uh, a little bit further northeast, uh, Santa Isabel, and we'll go look for mushrooms. Um, we'll go out and we'll have a good camaraderie with other people. It's a, like a big Easter egg hunt, but uh, you have no, nobody has any idea where any of the lay, eggs are laid or what the eggs are uh, because they're all mushrooms. And you go and you bring them and you come back and typically at the end, we'll all try to identify them together with expert identifiers. And every year we host our annual fungus fair, which is what you're attending right now, but our 2021 virtual fungus fair. Typically, these are hosted in the room in which we hold our meetings and lectures, which is Casa del Prado, room 101. And we end up having a variety of vendors and um, educational material, including more lectures, as well as um, actual mushroom specimens that we had just collected a few days earlier from a big foray to display local mushrooms in the area from that year. And uh, also plenty of food. And we also end up hosting film screenings. For instance, in 2019, we hosted the premiere of Fantastic Fungi here in San Diego in two different locations, uh, the La Paloma Theater for North County in Encinitas and the Hotel Del Coronado in Coronado um, for South County. And this is a fantastic film that was filmed by Louis Schwartzberg, the documentary filmmaker. And Paul Stamets was a big subject of this film, as you all might know that name. And both of them happened to attend um, our screenings at, or at screenings at Hotel Del Coronado. And Louis Schwartzberg also attended the La Paloma Theater screening. We also end up participating in many citizen science projects, such as the Mycoflora Project, which is a national, uh, a national effort to try to document all of the various different fungi within um, North America. And oftentimes it is used in conjunction with this other application, that you can download on your phones called iNaturalist. Uh, it is an amazing application that allows you to take photos of any organism, animal, plant, fungus, algae, whatever, and it will try to do its best algorithmically to tell you what it is, but then on top of that, there's a community of identifiers which can confirm the algorithm's identification. And we can teach you all how to take proper pictures, um, getting all the correct identifying features for fungi. And if you're wanting to participate in the Mycoflora project, which requires DNA barcoding, we can also teach you how to properly collect, handle, and preserve specimens for DNA barcoding. So what do you need to look for when identifying mushrooms? Well, there are a variety of different structures on mushrooms that are useful for identifying them. Obviously, there's the cap. Um, and the margin or the gills or pores, as well as the stem 
and any other features such as a veil or a vulva and the spores, which you can get spore prints from. But in particular, in all of these features, you're going to want to be looking for the features on the left, the color, the shape, the size, the texture, the smell, and even just a little bit of the taste, um, as well as the relevant environment. Is it growing next to the base of a tree? Is it growing on wood chips? Is it growing in grassland? Is it growing on dirt or sand? As well as the season, the time of the year. All of these things are incredibly relevant features for you to use to identify mushrooms um, by following keys. Or once you become very good, you'll be able to figure them out on your own without even following keys, especially if you know your area. So here's an example of a very common mushroom you might hear, see here in San Diego County. You've probably all seen this one, uh, Chlorophyllum molybides. It is known as the false parasol or the green spored lepiota or the vomitor. And it does live up to its name. It is poisonous, though not lethal, and it will make you vomit. So it is found in lawns and parks, and it's only actually found in California as well as Eastern North America, but not really in the middle of the country. And it has this really sort of green uh, spore print, uh, thus it also gets its other name, green spore lepiota. And they don't smell great, um, but you'll see them everywhere. They'll pop up all the time after rains. Another more interesting set of species are the genus Ganoderma. There we have several different species of Ganoderma here in San Diego County and Southern California in general, such as uh, Ganoderma polychromum or Aplanatum or brown, Brownii. All of them uh, are here and they can take on all various different shapes and sizes and they grow on the sides of trees, both living and dead. And while the reason why it says the variability or the edibility is variable is because while they're not poisonous, they're very tough and hard. So you wouldn't really want to eat them, but they are used oftentimes for medicinal purposes. And you can find Ganoderma species all around the world, although there are specialized species in given areas, such as these three, which are only found here in Southern California. Then there are many Agaricus species uh, that you can also find here. Agaricus species you'll be very familiar with because they are the traditional button mushrooms or field mushrooms. You, these are the ones that you will see in the stores, such as Agaricus bisporus, which is white button mushrooms, cremini mushrooms, and portobello. That one species is all three of those mushrooms in the food store, um, in the grocery store. You are being lied to if you think that they are three separate species. They are one species taken at different stages of development. But there are many other species of Agaricus beyond Agaricus bisporus, and some of them are quite delicious and other of the others are quite poisonous. There's um, A. xanthodermis, A. bitotorcus, and A. californicus. All of these three are found here in Southern California. And a general rule of thumb, which you should not use as a definitive statement, is when it comes to Agaricus species, the majority of Agaricus species that bruise yellow when you damage them when the, the color they bruise is yellow those are typically poisonous versus those that bruise red are typically edible again do not use that as your only factor to base it off of but it is a good rule of thumb and you can find these species anywhere on grass dirt sand leaves uh, they're quite variable where you can find them and then we have astraeus hygrometricus which is commonly known as the hydroscopic earth star or barometer earth star or false earth star. So it is an earth star and it gets its name because of its appearance. It's typically in the dirt or sand or rocks and it ends up having this really beautiful, almost flower-like shape, but with this big bulbous puffball in the center. And it is a puffball mushroom, which means that when the rain comes down and raindrops will hit it and it will puff up giant plumes of spores. Uh, other manual stimulation, you can poke it and it will do the same thing, or um, even like following debris from trees or animals scurrying by, those will all also puff it, but it is typically done during the rain. And interestingly, these things are edible, um, although it's typically not eaten here in the United States, but in Thailand, this species is actually considered a delicacy when they are young before they get old and crusty like this, they're actually still all enveloped and 
they're served like pickled um, and sauteed and apparently they're quite tender and delicious. I have not partaken myself, but I would be interested at some point in time. And you can find them all around the world, um, including here. This one is a particularly interesting species, uh, Luco coprinicus or coprinus tricolor. It does not have any common names because it is only really found here in North America and it's only really found in potted plants, interestingly enough. So there are some rare exceptions where you can find it outside, but the vast majority of the times it is found in potted plants, cultivated specifically. And because of this, we're not entirely sure about its origins, but we do know it is inedible. Um, it is mildly poisonous, but again, you mostly wouldn't want to eat it because it does not taste good. Um, and you don't need to worry about it. If it's in your potted plants, it will not damage your plants. So no need to take it out. Just enjoy the nice, pretty yellow mushrooms. Uh, so long as you do not have any animals that might eat it, such as dogs or cats, um, it might make their stomach upset if they get a hold of it. And another really interesting species is the Bushwaldo bolitis, uh, Saphrocho... Fatus. Um, I apologize for butchering the pronunciation of that Latin name, but its common name is the golden bolete. So a common feature of pretty much all boletes are this big, thick stem and a bulbous, a bulbous top, which is thick. And instead of gills, you have pores, these holes, which allow the spores to come out of instead of these slitted gills. And because this is only found along the California coast, it's not particularly well described, and some people believe it is edible and others don't. So it's possible that it's one of those situations where some people have a tolerance to any number of the various different compounds within it, and others are intolerant. Um, so it could just be down to a personal level. And you'll typically find these, though, on stumps and sawdust. And it has this very nice and brilliant yellow and a little bit of a red, a reddish stem. And another very charismatic uh, mushroom you'll find here is Lateromyces ceres, which is otherwise known as the chip cherry or red lead roundhead. So these are poisonous, unfortunately, but they're quite beautiful. And you can find them in wood chips, as their common name, chip cherry, suggests. And you can find them pretty much everywhere in the world along coasts, which is very interesting, this particular species. So while there are many more species that we could talk about, such as the bluet or lion's mane or turkey tail, we're going to leave it with those for the time being. And if you would like more information about what mushrooms exist here in Southern California um, and identifying any mushrooms you might happen to find on your next hike, we again highly recommend that you download the application iNaturalist or consult with um, the website Mushroom Observer. Or if you would like to, in addition to all of those, you can also upload photos to our San Diego Mycological Society Facebook page or our new Facebook group, SD Myco Community. You can also send us a message on Instagram or tag us on Instagram with a post or email us directly at sdmyco um, or sorry, sdmyco at gmail.com. And we're also affiliated with other mushroom events and conferences, such as NAMA, which is the North American Mycological Society. Um, we also um, are affiliated with some other mushroom fairs that you might be interested in, such as the Telluride Mushroom Festival or the Wisconsin uh, Conference for Women in Mushrooms. And if you'd like to know more, um, you should join us for our virtual meetings of the first Monday of every month, and you should become a member which um, gives you access to all of our fantastic workshops and, um, and forays and such, especially more so in normal times, but we're also putting together amazing events to make up for it during these quarantine times. And membership is only $25 for an entire year, 365 days. And under normal circumstances, we would be meeting in, again, Balboa Park, Casa del Prado, Room 101, uh, the first Monday of every month. And feel free to join us, please, uh, at sdmyco.org. That's where you can find our membership on our website. And if you'd like to watch the film, um, Fantastic Fungi, you can go to vimeo.com slash on demand slash fantastic fungi. Uh, highly recommend that film. It was amazing. And we were very proud to be able to put it on. So enjoy the rest of the fair. Thank you all so much for your time.